Today is Friday, February 20 something. 6th? I believe I think. so, yeah. 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Yes. And our good Don't. friend, you can see Vanessa in the background, Stephanie LeCue has stopped by because we are working on a project together. Yes, we are. Now, before we get into the project, Stephanie, the project has something to do with stars and astronomy? It has something to do with that, yes. Now, what do you think the equipment that's before you has to do with any of that? Well, my guess is that this is a mount for this scope. That is correct. Because of where the two holes are here and where the two nuts are there. Wow. You're technically very observant. Now, have you any background whatsoever in telescopy or no. astronomy at all? No. Zero. When did you first discover you had an interest in anything that had to do with the night sky? So when I was in high school, we had a gentleman come out to the farm that I grew up on, mm. and he explained um, human history in the, in the constellations. And it fascinated me because where I lived, the sky was very clear most of the time. We had a lot of stars. I noticed stars, but I didn't correlate them to meaning. Mm -hmm. I think until more that point, and so it was it was fascinating. I still have a hard time finding different constellations with mm -hmm. the naked eye, and um, I'm not sure that I could tell you exactly where the Big Dipper is and where the Little Dipper is, mm -hmm. but when you they're pointed out to me, I, I can see them and I get it. Because you're an artist, mm -hmm. a musician, yes, you are musician. able to like recognize patterns and things, Yes, and that's what the ancients did, didn't they? Yes, they did. Without distractions, without city lights, without all of the, you know, this ambient light that we have going on, they were, I think, maybe better suited to look up and really notice different patterns and light and, and things like that. You know, when we have a great big moon at night, and if I'm outside taking the trash down or something, it's brighter. So you, you notice that, but it's kind of hard because you still have the city lights, the street lights, the neighboring lights. So, yes, in our modern era, being able to clearly delineate the night sky yes. under various conditions is very challenging. And I will it? say, one of the one of the cooler nighttime experiences I had, though scary, was in Africa because we were out in the bush with nothing, mm -hmm. so we didn't have any of that ambient light that was a distraction. So it was kind of a neat experience, but it was terrifying because there was things that wanted to eat you, but. <laughs> well, like and, and things that people want to eat, unfortunately, in Africa, too. Right, there's that. So I'm Jeff Barber. I live here in John Day, and Stephanie lives in this area as well, the John Day Valley. And we have a bit of a project that's been cooking now for more than a year that has to do with the night sky and astronomy. But before we launch into that project, I just quickly wanted to review something about telescopy because it plays a huge role in our project. This here is what is called an, uh, an EQ3 mount. Uh, it's for light telescopes. It's EQ because it's equatorial, which means it's a type of mount that will allow you to just push in one direction to follow the stars as they arch across the sky. Because we know the Earth's a sphere, and as it rotates, the stars start on the east, and they rise to their highest point called culmination, and then they set to the west. And that's very important for our project because the culmination of things in the heavens is the best time to look at them through a telescope. Down here I have what is called a, a Vixen 4-inch, uh, 102 millimeter refractor. And it has a certain length to it, but it also has a certain width. And the width has to do with the 4 inches. Because like the human eye, which has a diameter when maximally dilated at about 6 to 7 millimeters, this telescope has uh, a lens in it too, but that lens is 102 millimeters across, which allows it to do what do you think, Stephanie? If you have a bigger lens, what does that do for you? You can see more. You can collect more light and you can resolve finer detail. Now this is a simply a very portable telescope. I can take it anywhere and observe. The limitation with it is it doesn't collect as much light as someone might like to collect. 
So when the telescope is mounted on the mount, it allows you to navigate throughout the heavens and track the stars in their motions. And because the telescope is portable, it allows you to do it. But as I said before, its portability is also its bane because it's not a large enough telescope to, to really reveal a lot of fine detail and very, very faint deep sky objects. So obviously, if you have something portable that's easy to carry around, you have a trade-off with performance. So our project has something to do with being able to install permanently the facilities to support a larger telescope that doesn't have to be ported around, and a lot falls out of that. This is one of the most important reference tools for all amateur astronomers. It's called a deep sky atlas. And basically what it does is it basically shows you in the heavens in two-dimensional format what you might want to look for in terms of the night sky. Now this one came out of a website that I used to have called astro.geekjoy.com that's still available as an archive on Google. So that is available for people and it covers observing up to about 2010. And I seriously got into observing after a childhood interest in about 1999. But at the same time, I also took up jazz music, which meant they were competing interests. Right now, I'm mostly focused on playing music. But I still love astronomy, and there's still a lot of the night sky to be observed. But what an atlas like this does for you is it allows you to find things in the heavens. So for instance, based on what time of year it is. So right now, for instance, you pointed out that you could find the, the um, that you might be able to find the Little Dipper or the Big Dipper. This shows you the orientation that it would be at, at a certain time of the year, and it says right here that it would be, uh, the way that we would look in late Ju July. So in late July, if you were to look up into the heavens around as soon as it got dark outside, which is about 10 o'clock in July, mm -hmm. this is how the stars would be arranged and it would tell you where all kinds of little interesting things that you might want to look at to find. Now, modern astronomy doesn't require something like this anymore because as you, the telescope that I have set aside for the project that we're working on has the ability to navigate based on a database to anything you want to see. So mm -hmm. all you have to do is punch in the designation. It could be a Messier object. Messier 42, for instance, the Great Orion Nebula. Or it could be a very, very obscure NGC, uh, NGC catalog object, which could be much smaller and fainter, or possibly even larger and fainter. But the, the thing is, it gives you access to all these catalogs. So you just type in the designation, and the telescope, if it's properly aligned and set up for the time of year and the date, will automatically slew across the heavens, and if you've done a good job of it, you'll look in the eyepiece of the telescope, which, by the way, is located this end of the telescope, and you will see what you were looking for. Very cool. I have noticed about amateur astronomers is we all have a tendency to find something, look at it for 30 seconds, and then want to go find something else. We don't spend much time. And I discovered as an amateur astronomer that you're much more likely to spend a lot of time looking at something if you're using both eyes. This is known as a bino viewer. This allows you to put two eyepieces of the same focal length, which, is the, which governs the magnification of things you see, into this, put this in to the telescope, like this, and now you have the capacity to see with both hemispheres of the brain. And mm. when you do that, you will simply marvel at what you see. It'll be like you're falling or traveling through space looking at things. Very cool. So this is a very important piece of equipment to have if you want to truly feed the aspirations of observers. Why? Because these small telescopes don't give views the way a, photo, a large telescope using astrophotography or, would, would give you. It's just, we just don't have enough sensitivity in our eyes and the scopes are too small. But if you can find a way to present something to the human brain that fully engages you, 
you will have, you'll find that you're, you'll have a great, much more enhanced appreciation for the night sky. So this is just a couple of things that I want to point out before we get around to actually working our project together. See the screen here before me? Yes. This was done using a very small telescope, a 90 millimeter, which is actually smaller than the telescope right. that I just showed you. Because you, that one is 100 and something? 102, okay. 4 inch. This was done through a small telescope on a, on a mount that tracks things as they move across the heaven, multiple exposures. And this is a view of the great galaxy in Andromeda, M31. And you would have to have a 30-inch telescope to be able to see a view like this. Now, it, wouldn't it be lovely if you could see something like that? Mm -hmm. Now, you'll notice in this there's dust lanes. Mm -hmm. This is areas of cold, dark matter. Not dark matter, but cold, dark matter in the, M30, in the Andromeda galaxy that eventually will turn into stars. Now, with a 10-inch telescope, not a 4-inch, these dark dust lanes are visible. This is the same image that we saw in the screen cap, and I'll point out a few things. So, with a telescope that's maybe twice or three times as large as the 4-inch over there, you would see these dark lanes. Even small telescopes who will show you the satellite galaxies, which is M110 and M32 of the Andromeda galaxy. It also has a couple far north, far north from here that I've seen through. This is a region of star formation, and this is an NGC object, and you would be able to see that through a small telescope for a six-inch telescope. So you can see all these things, but it doesn't jump out at you quite the same way. And another important factor is the environment you're at. The sky has to be really dark. Your eyes have to have fully adapted because you get rhodopsin that's secreted inside your retina to improve your light sensitivity. All right? So there's a number of things. The sky has to be very clear. It doesn't have to be stable necessarily for galaxies. It would for the moon and planets. But you can see a lot of this, but not as the kind of stark detail. So what is very important then in terms of our project is we'd have to have a location that has really clear dark skies that are free of ambient light. For instance, here in John Day, they do have astro-friendly lights. There's those amber lamps, but they don't have the skirts around them, so the light comes straying into my backyard if I take the telescope out to observe with. So location of where you put the telescope is very, very, and the telescope is very important for your observing. And the weather, of course. Mm. So there's a number of factors that all are implicated in the project that Stephanie and I are about to more fully develop that have to do, excuse me, <clears throat> that have to do with equipment, has to do with preparation, has to do with conditions of the sky at the time of the observing, and the most important thing is has to be readily accessible so that you can just say, wow, tonight's incredible. Let's go to the observatory. observatory. So we just revealed our project to folks. <laughs>
Yes, you can hear the wind blow, you can see the stars glow, but it means nothing without the essence of love. Yes, you can see the stars glow, you can hear the wind blow, but it means nothing without the essence of love. We're now going to go and take a look at a slightly larger telescope, one that is destined as my contribution as a hosting astronomer in the project that we just talked about. And what was the project we just talked about called? Uh, Carpe Noctem Observatory Project. Right, right. In which, the goal of which is to help people become inspired by, by being the eyes of the universe. the universe looking back at itself. Okay. <laughs> so my telescope that I would have for this project is a six inch semi-apochromatic refractor, which is pretty much close to the top of the line you can get. This is the telescope right here, right? Wow. And instead of being four inches, it's six inch. Mm -hmm. Now, what makes this a special telescope is this. First off, it's almost fully color corrected, which means all the spectrum comes to the same focus as the eye. Second, because it's a refractory telescope, it has no obstruction in it, which means there's nothing that causes a thing called diffraction, which reduces the contrast of the image. Okay. So the image contrast is impeccable. Okay. Third thing about this type of telescope is, even though it doesn't have a lot of aperture, when you do see something in it, it is beautiful because the dark sky background with the object brings out the greatest amount of contrast. Fourth thing is, this is the best telescope you could ever use for looking at the moon and planets under normal conditions. Because sky conditions usually determine what you can see, and a six inch refractor will give you the best possible view of the moon and planets and double stars that you can possibly get from a telescope under normal observing conditions. So you can have a larger telescope, and see fainter things, but it won't present with quite the same amount of artistic beauty, okay. even though you can't see many of the things that you would ordinarily see in a larger telescope. So I consider a six inch refractor to be the optimal telescope for just using your eyes to observe the heavens cool. in terms of seeing things that are inspiring. And this telescope, when combined with a bino viewer, mm -hmm. would be awesome. Right. Uh, absolutely awesome. And does this have a bino viewer? No, the bino viewer I showed you earlier is... is only for the four inch? No, no. It'll work on either of these telescopes. Okay. All right? Cool. So this will be my instrument when I host at the observatory, Carpe Noctum Observatory, yes. when, it's, when I sign up to be the host. And cool. I will bring the telescope, but the mount will already be there, according to the project. Mm -hmm. And we'll set up, and then we'll have, have members of the public come. 
and then do a tour of the little tour of the heavens, whatever's best seen at the time. It could be planets, it could be globular clusters, it could be galaxies, it could be star clusters, it could be nebulae, planetary nebulae, it could be any of the number of denizens in the night sky that are so spectacular when you see them yourself through your own eyes. Cool. All right. Very good. Yeah.